Matthew chapter 15, 1 to 20, page 869. Then Pharisees and scribes came from Jerusalem to Jesus and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break God's commandment because of your tradition? For God said, Honour your father and your mother, and the one who speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, Whoever tells his father or mother, whatever benefit you might have received from me as a gift committed to the temple, he does not have to honour his father. In this way you have revoked God's word because of your tradition. Hypocrites, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, These people honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain teaching as doctrines the commands of men. Summoning the crowd, he told them, listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then the disciples came up and told him, do you know that the Pharisees took offence when they heard this statement? He replied, every plant that my heavenly father didn't plant will be uprooted. Leave them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind guide the blind, both will fall into a pit. Then Peter replied to him, explain this parable to us. Are even you still lacking in understanding, he said? Don't you realise that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a man. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man. But eating with unwashed hands doesn't defile a man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, growing up, uh, we had no television, which wasn't a great loss. Uh, One of our treats was visiting Nana and Onk's house. Onk was our name for my mother's father. Uh, They lived in a little Duplo on the Lane Cove River. And whenever we visited them, we got our television fix. Uh, Saturday mornings were spent in front of the television, uh, eggs, soldiers watching Looney Tunes. Saturday afternoons was lying next to Onk in his bed and spending six hours with Ken Sutcliffe in Wide World of Sports. But one of the highlights was Saturday evenings where we'd watch Keeping Up Appearances and The Bill. Uh, Keeping Up Appearances, well, it would always leave me with a sore mouth because I laughed so hard. I had to wipe the tears off my cheeks and my ribs would be sore. Uh, The bumbling attempts of Hyacinth Bouquet to leave her lower class history behind to climb that social ladder of the British class system. It was hilarious. She always attempted to hide who she truly was. She wanted to keep her brother-in-law Onslow in the cabinet. She tried to impress the world with her sophistication, her wealth and her son Sheridan's achievements. Uh, It was a comedy of much laughter. But if you paused and had a think... There were some incisive comments about the British class system, weren't there? Keeping up appearances could be the title for today's passage, couldn't it? Keeping up appearances. Uh, It could be the title if the stakes weren't so high and the consequences weren't so eternal. Keeping up appearances could also be an incisive comment from today's passage to the people who ask the question, and perhaps the people who read it today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for its goodness. Thanks for its availability. Uh, Thanks for its clarity. Uh, Father, there are so many complex threads in this passage, but there is a very clear tapestry, a one which confronts keeping up appearances and turns us to our hearts and the need we desperately have. Help us to understand this today. In Jesus' name, amen.
I remember we're going through Matthew's good news biography of Jesus. Uh, We're doing that over eight years, a chunk each year. Remember Matthew's big idea, let me remind you, God provides new beginnings through his promised King Jesus who brings the outsiders in. Uh, In his first public statement, Jesus is very clear that new beginnings begin with repentance. Uh, Repentance is a very easy term to understand. It's chucking a U-turn in your mind, in your heart, and in your life, realising that you being God doesn't work and God being God does. Uh, In his first sermon in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, Jesus makes clear that such new beginnings is what God has always planned and promised, that such new beginnings involve the whole person, They involve their heart and their mind, their heart and their hands, their walk and their words, their proclamation, their practice. In fact, all of God's words, all of God's revelation, all of God's commands are contained in this man, Jesus, who is speaking to people. He is God's words in the flesh. He didn't come to do away with God's words. He came to be God's words for outsiders like us. That is so important to get straight from the beginning. Jesus is concerned with the whole person, starting with their hearts and minds. And as he begins that first sermon, if you cast your minds back to when we looked at it in 2019, he helps his disciples realise this very important truth. Their hearts and minds are far from God and they need help. If the outsiders are to become part of God's people, their hearts must be dealt with. And that has always been God's plan. And the only way that that will happen is if people are connected to Jesus. Well, that's how Jesus kicks off and he continues that way, which brings us to chapter 15. I'm at point two on the outline. Look at verse one. Then Pharisees and scribes came from Jerusalem to Jesus and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat. Baxter, if you could bring up that next slide with that map, please, mate. As we think about this question, it's a question uh, that we have posed, I suspect, at some point in various ways. It's actually phrased in the present tense. We've got to understand two background features. Now, I know that map isn't great. That's why I've used red. Red always stands out. But we've got to get the geography straight from verse 1. See that red dot up the top? That's where Jesus is at the moment. If you go right down to the bottom to that bottom bit of water and about halfway down, that's where Jerusalem is. So for these religious leaders to ask Jesus this question, they've travelled over 150 kilometres on foot. Do you think it's an important question they want to ask? Do you think they're personally invested in this question? Do you think they're actually serious about taking Jesus on? Those religious leaders never go to hillbilly country, which is where Jesus is. They stay in the sophisticated city of Jerusalem. But now they've travelled over 150 kilometres and they want to ask him a question. And secondly, do you notice where they attack? Did you pick that up? They don't attack Jesus, do they? Did you see that? They actually ask questions about the disciples. They ask questions about the students because if they can get the students caught, then they must have learned it from the teacher, mustn't they? And it's too dangerous to take Jesus on full on because he's so popular. So why don't we go for the disciples and let the crowd join the dots? The question itself is really simple. Uh, Look at it there in verse 2. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands when they eat. Uh, This particular tradition of washing your hands in your household every time you came in from the outside world and sat down to a meal, it's actually not in the Old Testament. It's actually taken from an Old Testament command. Uh, God did command his priests to do this in Exodus chapter 30. And they were to wash their hands as they got ready to sacrifice animals. 
And so everything about it should say to people, it's just a picture of how serious sin is. You've got to be prepared when you come before God. And this picture of washing shows how serious sin is. The attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. And so in the period between the two Testaments, in that 400 years between the Old and New Testament, as God's people struggled to know what it looked like to be God's people, the religious leaders developed a set of rules, kind of like a set of fences, so that none of God's people even came close to being unprepared for God, even came close to breaking the rules. And so if it's good enough for the priests, it's good enough for the people. And so you had to wash every time you came in from the outside and sat down for a meal. And in time, you know how we go with rules, don't you? The rules become the most important thing. And so you end up with this massive set of more than 400 rules that aim to protect you from breaking God's commands. In time, those 400 rules actually become the focus, don't they? And so when these men come to question Jesus, they've got a problem. I think they're really asking, hey, Jesus, you don't fit. We can't work out what you're on about. You don't fit into our rules, our traditions, our customs, our models. You don't fit, Jesus. Please explain yourself. Now, Jesus is always ready to take an opportunity, isn't he? So look there in verse 3, I'm at point 3 on the outline. He takes the opportunity, doesn't he? He answered them. Uh, why do you break God's commandment because of your tradition? Jesus is asked a question, and so he asks a question, doesn't he? And let me tell you, it's a pretty brutal question, isn't it? Uh, when you actually sit down and compare it, he uses the exact same words that the religious leaders use but he just changes one thing, doesn't he? Do you notice what they ask about? Why do you break tradition? Do you notice what Jesus asked? Why do you use tradition to break God's commandments? It's pretty brutal, isn't it? It's pretty open and honest. In fact, I think Jesus is saying, don't worry about where I fit. Don't worry about whether you can fit me into your system. Instead, you should worry because you've lost sight of the big picture. You've lost sight of the big picture of God's words and God's commands. And then he shows them, doesn't he, with an, with an example. Did you pick that up? Look at verse 4. For God said, honour your father and your mother. And the one who speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, whoever tells his father or mother, Whatever benefit you might have received from me as a gift committed to the temple, he does not have to honour his father in this way. You have revoked God's word because of your tradition. God's command is very clear, isn't it? The fifth commandment, well, we heard it as Lynn read. And then Exodus 21, 17, about the seriousness of honouring your parents. And yet the leaders have created a way to look good by avoiding God's commands, haven't they? You see, if you can take that lump sum of money that you might have used to care for your parents in their dotage and you say, that 50 grand is now devoted to God. I'm sorry, mum and dad. Well, that 50 grand will go to God when you die, but until that day, you can use it however you want. So you can buy that new chariot. You can buy that new set of sandals. You can throw that dinner party for your son's big birthday, but because it's devoted to God, it well, I can't really spend it on you, mum and dad. And do you notice what they've done? They've used a tradition to avoid keeping God's commands. The tradition keeps up appearances, doesn't it, because you've devoted it to God, but it avoids the truth. They've used a tradition to appear good 
while avoiding being godly. They've used a tradition to appear good whilst avoiding being godly. And Jesus rebukes them. Look at verse 7. Hypocrites, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, These people honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commands of men. Hypocrites. Now, you know what that word means? It's the Greek word for actors. Literally, it means you bunch of mask wearers. The leaders are just like Hyacinth Bouquet. They're all about keeping up appearances. Their lips say this, but their hearts run that way. They offer God vanity or emptiness rather than what he deserves. And they teach their traditions rather than the commands of God. They've missed the big picture, haven't they? God's words and God's commands. Instead, they play religion. They play religion. They focus on looking good and they ignore godliness. They focus on their faces and they ignore their hearts. Their mouths mouth the right phrases. Their mouths sing the right songs. Their mouths utter the right words. And their hearts dance to another tune. They've lost sight of the big picture. Because they've lost sight of the big picture, they've lost sight of the deep issue, haven't they? I'm at point four on the outline. Because they've lost sight of the deep big picture, They've lost sight of the deep issue. And Jesus wants to drive that home. And so he summons the crowd. Look there in verse 10. I suspect the crowd has stepped back as these religious leaders have stepped forward and they've just stepped back to let the religious guys sort it out. Well, Jesus has sorted it out, but it's so important that he wants the crowd to listen. And he launches in his comments to them off the question that was asked of him, And what Isaiah has said about people's hearts. Look there in verse 10. Summoning the crowd, he told them, listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. It's a command. Open your ears. Understand. What goes into your mouth is not what establishes where you are with God. What comes out of your mouth reveals the state of your heart. Where a person stands before God is not a matter of what they eat, what's under their fingernails, what's on their skin. Uh, Where a person stands with God is a matter of what their heart produces. And because these men have lost sight of the big picture, they've failed to realise the deep issue. They've settled for appearing good when God is concerned with godliness. They've ticked the boxes and they've ignored their hearts. The command of God in the Old Testament about washing was connected to sacrifices, wasn't it? To how big sin is. Sin is not a matter of soap and water. Sin is not a matter of dirt under the fingernails. Sin is a matter of the heart and what it produces. And let me tell you, God has always been about that. Let me give you two very quick examples before we finish off. Uh, In Genesis 3, as Adam and Eve disobey God, as they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the issue isn't the act of disobedience, is it? The issue is the heart that produces the disobedience. God himself picks that up as he moves to the end of Genesis 3 because humans now think in their hearts that they can take God's job and decide what is right and wrong. And God's words focus on the heart, which is revealed in the actions. It's the same with Jesus in Matthew 5. Remember Matthew 5, you got the Beatitudes, and then Jesus says where he stands in relationship to God's word. And, and then Jesus unpacks six parts of God's law, doesn't he? Do you remember that? You say, do not murder, but I say, 
You say, do not lie, but it's really easy to appear good. You haven't buried your neighbour in a in a grave. You haven't stood up in a law court and told a lie. You haven't slept with your neighbour. It's really easy to appear good. But you notice what Jesus does there in Matthew chapter 5? If you've done it in your head, if you've done it in your heart, you've got a problem. It's not about box ticking. It's about godliness. God's words and commands are not concerned with human goodness. They're concerned with the lack of godliness, with the state of the human heart. And Jesus wants the crowd to know that. They're shocked. Did you notice that with the question from the disciples in verse 12? Hey, Jesus, uh, you realise you might have offended these men? (laughs) These religious leaders are regarded as the best of the best. Jesus, you've offended them. How does Jesus respond there in verse 13 and 14? Leave them alone. They're blind. Don't spend time with them. Those leaders have no place in God's people. That's pretty confronting for the disciples, isn't it? These people they'd put on a pedestal have just been exposed, or at least their hearts have, and so the disciples are puzzled. And Peter says in verse 15, Hey, Jesus, just explain this a bit further for us. And so Jesus does. Look at verse 16. Are even you still lacking in understanding, he asked. Don't you realise that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? Or what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a man. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Jesus is frustrated, isn't he? On the one hand, that's encouraging. We're just as slow as the disciples. On the other hand, it's confronting. And did you notice that when Jesus unpacks this, he really just returns to all of those things he dealt with in Matthew chapter 5? All of those laws? The food one eats, the dirt under your fingernails, the wax behind your ears, the culture between your toes? That doesn't defile you. That doesn't make you unacceptable to God. The things that come from your heart, the lustful thoughts, the hatred, the jealousy, the slander, that is what reveals where you stand with God. Sin is a matter of the heart and the attitude revealed in action. It comes from deep within us. It's not a matter of what we digest, but it's a matter of what we spit out. And that list from Jesus is not exhaustive, but it's inclusive of every human being. I mean, we're caught there just on the first one, aren't we? The evil thoughts. The religious leaders miss the big picture of God's commands and so they miss the deep issue of the human heart. God is not interested in keeping up appearances when ungodliness spews out of our hearts. God is not interested in rule-keeping when the heart wanders elsewhere. God's words and commands reveal that his intent is the whole person from the inside out. And sin is not something caught, it is something produced from deep within us. Keeping up appearances, it made me laugh. But it's not a new phenomenon, is it? And it's not a BBC comedy show only. It's the description of the human life when we try to deal with God in our way. It's the state of the religious leaders in Jesus' day, focusing on rules and regulations that made them look good 
but hid the state of their hearts. And God has always been concerned about this. He's concerned about this because it is all of our problems. Romans 3 verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. We can't avoid the exposure of this incident. The question the religious leaders ask is in the present tense. We're meant to hear it. And after we saw last week that Jesus is God's son, we're now being stretched to think about how I deal with God. Do I deal with God with the big picture and the deep issue? Now, before we go any further, let me just point out that Jesus never plays God's word off against each other, does he? Do you notice Jesus never does that? A God says this and God says this, which one do I like? That's what the religious leaders did. Jesus never does that. Jesus wants us to get the big picture of all of God's words and commands. And when you get that big picture, let me raise for you some of the questions that are posed as a way of finishing. Have we lost sight of the big picture of God's commands and so lost sight of the deep issue of our hearts? Do we nullify, destroy, wipe out the commands of God with our manufactured traditions? Do we settle for box-ticking goodness when our hearts are just so deceptively ungodly? Do we play a role in this part of our life but reveal our hearts in this part of our life? Are we serious about knowing that God's words examine our hearts and call them to submit to his son? Let me pray. Father, there is so much going on in this passage, uh, but really it's as simple as paying attention to the big picture of your word so that the deep issue of our hearts is exposed. Please do that in us today by your spirit so that we go out into the world to bring people to a God who is serious about hearts and serious about whole people. Amen.